cool. No questions so far. So first question to you. Um, what makes a programming language, like what are the elements that make a programming language? What, how, how would you categorize it? What do you have to pay attention when you're learning a new language, like how you organize yourself? Logic? There is some, uh, let me stop sharing and reshare it. So let me see. I see. Okay. So, um, syntax. Yes, syntax is a very good category. Uh, what is the syntax of the language, right? So, for example, if you're comparing uh, Golang with C, you have a uh, concept of loops, for loops, and then syntax in C++ or C is different than in Golang, and then you have to learn kind of a new syntax. I had a syntax problem in the last class with the with Golang, for example. So syntax, paradigm, um, and logic, and a set of rules. Those are right. So so we kind of have syntax and concepts, right? So um, or paradigm. So those are two things. Because if you're comparing, let's say C and and Golang. And go, you kind of have similar concepts. You have a concept of a struct, let's say, or you have a concept of a loop. The concepts are the same. The syntax is different, right? Um, you have also pointers. Good. Uh, those are good, um, good suggestions. So let's let's iterate. Syntax, yeah, that's that's an important. So what is syntax? Syntax is the way the language concepts are expressed in text, right? The, the expression in a textual format. And then you have an abstract syntax. So for example, if I, um, if I have a loop, a for loop in C, and I have a for loop in, uh, in Golang. So on the syntax level, it will be completely different or a struct, let's say. I have a struct in C and struct in Golang. So syntax is completely different. And then I parse it. I create a abstract syntax tree to represent what I have now in the, in the language. And they might be identical because here I have a struct and here I have a struct and here I have a two fields and here I have two fields and here I have a two fields of string and here I have two fields of string. So the abstract syntax might be exactly the same where the concrete syntax is different. Do you understand that? So on the paper, we have kind of a, a, a concrete representation of the syntax. And then when we want to do something with it, when we're writing a compiler or interpreter, let's say we have an assignment, right? So we're assigning uh, 10 to A, okay? I have a variable A and I'm assigning 10 to A. On the syntax level, C and Golang will be different. And then on the abstract syntax, I say, I have a variable A, whose name is A, and I have a value, literal 10, and there is an assignment. So on the abstract syntax, the representation might be identical because I'm doing the same thing, right? So it's kind of funny because most languages are very alike on the abstract syntax. They differ in the concrete syntax. Um, and then I have semantics. And the semantics is what does it mean? So what does it mean to assign 10 to A? right? Is it legal in that language? What if A is immutable and it already has a value? Is that assignment legal, right? 
Maybe it is not legal. So semantics is what does it mean? What will it do? Um, so those are the three main things which kind of make a language, right? So we have a text, we parse the text into this abstract representation, and then we know from the specification what that, what that means. But there is one more. And that one more is languages kind of make you solve problems in a certain way because the language forces you into a particular way of thinking, right? Um, and that has to do with the paradigm. Paradigm was, has been mentioned uh, and that's what it is. It, it is kind of a way of thinking about the problems. So if you have an object-oriented language like C++ or Java, you think about problems in a certain way because that, that way fits into the language or the language fits into the way of thinking about the problems, right? So causality often comes like when you're starting programming, the causality of the way of thinking comes from the language. You sort of solve problems because you have to do it that, that way in that language. As you learn more programming languages and as you kind of mature as a problem solver or programmer, your way of thinking is kind of independent of the language itself. And you may be doing things like you probably have seen code uh, in C++, which is very complicated because somebody is, is solving a problem in a certain way, in a kind of a different way than you would, right? Uh, so then there is kind of a mismatch between the what the language can do for you and what is your way of thinking of solving the problem? So it's a little bit complicated, but let's try. Let's try to look into that. So try to explain to a ten-year-old who never did any programming what is a loop. We take loop for granted. I'm sure you all take loop for granted. You've been using them a lot. Uh, if you were to explain to somebody what loop is, what would you do? So the, the first programming language I learned in school, I was in a high school, which was um, kind of an electronic specialization. We were building digital circuits and we were specializing in electronics. Um, so the first programming language I learned was assembly and assembly made perfect sense to me. Like uh, you have registers, you move stuff around and you have a go-to to jump back to the earlier instructions. And it was a very simple, very, you know, good language to, to start with. And then the second language we were learning was Pascal. And Pascal is kind of like, uh, it's like Golang a little bit like C. Uh, you have structured uh, procedures and then you have four loops. And then I was learning a for loop, what, what for loop is doing. And of course, go to was like natural, like it was very trivial to me, but learning what for loop was, it took me like three days to work out what for loop is doing, right? You, you may laugh because it's so trivial, but it wasn't trivial to me. Like uh, I, I, I was puzzled, like, uh, so what, what does it do? Like it has this state, right? It has this variable which kind of contains the state and that was kind of weird. So I, I had to kind of work it out and kind of run some for loops myself on paper and kind of understand what the hell is going on. Um, all right, so, um, and it's instruction which runs several times. Uh, that sounds good, but that sounds kind of like a recursion, right? So you have an instruction and you kind of are calling it multiple times. That feels a little bit like recursion. Uh, doing something multiple times. Uh, spinning in circle repeatedly. Repeat a set of instructions. Um, repeat. Perfect, perfect. Those are really good um, kind of uh, structured programming um, definitions. Yeah, this is also a little bit more uh, recursive like. Um, is, is recursion a form of looping? When, when we talk about loops, do you think about recursion? Probably not, right? W what do you think about for loop or while loop, right? Uh, or go to? Um, 
So th those are kind of a good, good definitions, but they are very procedural like, and they define how something is achieved, right? So uh, do, do this and then go here and do it again, or do this, do this multiple times. So we, we're gonna come back to that in a moment. So keep, keep, that, in, keep that in mind, like what, what really is a loop? Um, okay. Um, oh yeah, we have some quizzes with points. Okay. All right, a bit of a history. Um, history sidetrack. So when was Haskell designed or developed or invented? Do you think computer science things are invented or they are developed? <laughs> yeah, very nice. A, a bell curve. All right, so you usually um, when you have a spectrum, and the extremes seem unlikely, then usually it's a middle answer. <laughs> you, but uh, your mileage may vary with that. All right, so language timeline. Um, of course, the first languages which we used historically were kind of assembly-like. They were very low level. They were exactly telling the CPU what to do, right? And then we had C. So C was already a huge improvement. Uh, over assembly and that's kind of you know 70s as you see 72 was a very uh active year uh a lot of kind of a uh, core languages came about so c you know c that's a c line it's like a structured um uh, kind of a uh, manually managed memory language with the feel of kind of assembly like you tell exactly what should happen right um ML, uh, it's a very logic-based uh, declarative functional language with no variables, no loo loops. Um, it's kind of, it has a very similar feel to Haskell. So if you think about F-sharp, OCaml, and Haskell, that's ML, which started that line. Um, and then Smalltalk. Have you heard of Smalltalk? Smalltalk is the true object-oriented language and the term object orientation was coined by Alan Kay, who was the author of Smalltalk. So if we talk about object oriented languages, the, the old guys, we think Smalltalk. Uh, C++ is called object oriented, but it lacks a lot of features which the true object oriented languages have. Uh, and Smalltalk is kind of in between. It has classes and it has instances and objects, but it's not properly object-oriented in the definition of the term which the Alan K defined. So there is this ongoing discussion what, you know, why we call C++ object-oriented and it's just, you know, uh, became kind of a de facto definition, right? Uh, but kind of, if, if you go to the essence, um, Smalltalk has a lot of features which some other languages have, which are proper object-oriented and C++ is not, quite there. Java is a little bit better, but also not quite there. So that the really two very object-oriented languages is Smalltalk, or, or three, Self, which was precursor of, of Java, and Objective-C. Uh, those are kind of the languages which are much more object-oriented than C++. Anyway, that's it was kind of a, a, a nice year to be in. Uh, and then they kind of continued development. So. Smalltalk got mixed up with C and we got Objective-C. And Objective-C is like, a, again, a proper object-oriented language with features borrowing from C. We have C++, which is also object-oriented, but without certain features. Uh, so they gave up some of the things uh, in order to make the language a little bit smaller and also more compatible with C. Uh, so it's kind of an addition to C, like, you know, um, C++ is a superset, right? C, C was a subset of, of C++. And then we have Miranda and Haskell, and those are kind of a descendants of ML. Uh, that's the line of languages from uh, coming from ML. And then in 90s, we had Python very early on, 
So Python is a, a really old language. In, in my days, Python was always like, uh, you know, you, you only use it for something that is really small. Uh, you never really do a, big things with it. Uh, then we had Java that had a lot of uh, weight, marketing weight from some, some microsystems and so on. And we have OCaml, which is also coming from, from ML line. And then in 2000s, we have the modern programming languages, which is like C-sharp, very good, very modern virtual machine, better than a Java virtual machine because they, uh, it allows for tail recursive uh, optimi optimizations. Uh, we have F-sharp, again, a descendant from Haskell and OCaml. Uh, we have Go, which is the reification of C, and we have Rust, which combines Haskell with kind of a manual memory management from C. So you kind of see how those languages were kind of coming about and how they relate to each other. And you can kind of traverse the inheritance tree, like which language borrowed features and borrowed things. And as I said, like on the syntax level, don't it doesn't really matter. What you should be comparing is this abstract syntax and semantics. What languages have which concepts and how they, how they feel uh, and how you use them for solving problems. Okay, so then Haskell. Um, why, why, like, given that there was already um, uh, Miranda, which was kind of a, a modern ML and ML and some other um, implementations of uh, um, functional languages, uh, why Haskell came about? Um, well, the, the research community wanted to have a, a platform for experimenting with different language features. And there was nothing that was common to everybody. Like people were uh, putting like pseudocode or code snippets for, for different programming languages and they, it was kind of incompatible. So if you wanted to talk about some, some constructions of programming languages, it was kind of uh, all over the place. So they wanted to have a common open platform which could be used to discuss concepts. Um, and it was bootstrapped by a research community and it has quite a long, release cycle. So the new version of the languages um, come about from experimentation. And how does it happen? Well, um, some it's a little bit similar to C++. So somebody writes like a extension to the compiler. It says this is a new feature. And then the community can turn it on, try it out for like, you know, 10 years. And then people either like it or hate it. And then people either get beaten by it because it's, it's not working in long term or it's great. And then it gets incorporated into a language. So the cycle is kind of like 10 years. Uh, a new version of the language kind of come, roughly speaking, every 10 years. Um, so the one which we're using is 2010. Um, all right. So question two, only two two rate graded questions today. Oh yeah, that one is um, tricky. So lazy and compiled, that's kind of unusual. Uh, you don't have many lazy compiled languages, purely functional statically typed with type inference, concise and with managed memory. And Haskell is all of them, right? So which one is the most distinguishing feature? I think it's probably the first one um, because a lot of uh, functional languages out there uh, are not as lazy as, as Haskell is. Um, what does that mean? Well, we'll see in a moment. So only two questions, pretty uniform distribution, C++ one, <laughs> nice. Okay, so as when I ask you about what loop is, all of you said how the loop will do things, right? Do this, iterate this and blah, blah, blah. Nobody said what it is. Yeah, it's kind of a nuanced thing, right? So imperative programming kind of focuses on how to achieve something. And you have it from C. Like C has this kind of, a, you know, the need to tell the CPU what to do exactly. Move this here, assign here, this to here, and so on. 
Um, declarative languages, including Haskell, you say what something is instead of how to do something, right? And the how comes from the runtime system. The runtime system decides how to do something. You only told it what you want, not how to do it, okay? Um, that's the kind of a, a main distinguishing feature. So imperative programming, you define step-by-step step what to do. In declarative programming, you define a lot of concepts, a lot of things of what you need, what you want, and then the system just solves it, kind of does it for you. Of course, programming is always kind of in between, but if you're doing programming with C++ or C, you're kind of in that realm. You can't really declare a lot of things. You kind of need to tell the, the system what to do. Um, if you're in a language which allows you, or paradigm which allows you to do it more declaratively, you kind of specifying what much more frequently. So it is lazy. Um, what does it mean that the language is lazy? A rule of thumb, like how can you say a language is lazy or not? So if you can have infinite list or infinite array in a language, the language is lazy. If you cannot, the language is not. Can you declare an infinite list in any of the languages you know? Can you say, oh, I have an infinite list which goes from one to infinity? You cannot. In Haskell, you can, right? So I can go, um, I will sit. So um, uh, GHCI is a kind of an interactive interpreter for Haskell. And I can say, I have a list which goes from one to infinity. And this list is L, okay? And now L is uh, an infinite, list which goes from one to infinity. And if I try to print it, it is gonna uh, clog my uh, screen, right? So I can say, okay, just take first 10 items from L and print just 10 first items, okay? And it prints just the first 10 items. Um, so in Haskell, you can have very easily infinite data structures or infinite things. Uh, in Golang or C, you cannot, right? So that, that's what laziness means. It means that you can declare or think in terms of kind of infinities, uh, whereas in normal languages, you cannot. Um, it's statically typed, you know what that means. It's purely functional. Uh, so what, are the, what is a pure function? Yeah? Say it again. No variables. No variables. Maybe some other definitions. What What if you say pure in C++ that the function is pure? What does that mean? You cannot change what? The function itself? Yeah. You, you kind of get the feel, uh, but yeah, I will not, I haven't talked about functions yet, but yeah. Okay, so Espen in, in, a, in a chat says the result is always the same. That That's one property of a pure function. So it has uh, two aspects. So if you have a function, the function lives in some context and it takes some parameters and it produces some result, right? So if the function doesn't change the context or if the function doesn't use the context to calculate the output, what it means is that if a function takes some parameters, it will always produce the same result and the state around the function will not change, right? So if I have a function which takes two parameters and returns a sum of those two parameters, that's a pure function because it doesn't read anything from the environment and it doesn't change anything in the environment, right? But if I have a function which takes two numbers and multiplies it with some sort of a con constant, 
from somewhere, or if it prints something to the screen, that function is not pure because it has a side effect like printing something to the screen, or the calculation may be different depending on the context in which I run that function. So that function is not pure. So what are the properties of pure functions? Well, the pure function I can run as many times and my logic of my program will not change. So if I have, you know, add two numbers function and I call it 10 times and I call it only once, it doesn't matter in, in my program because the result is always the same. And if I have a pure function which adds two numbers together and I call, computed it once, I don't need to compute it ever again for those two the same numbers because the result will be the same. So I can cache the result and never call that function again once I calculated it once, right, for those uh, inputs. Um, whereas if I have side effects, so if I you know, have printout, for example, and I call the function once, I have one printout, but if I call it 100 times, I have 100 printouts, that, that's different, right? So pure means no side effects, and the calculation only depends on the inputs, right? So if you say in C++, this function is pure, you guarantee that you're not changing anything outside of that function, and the calculation only uses the two parameters or whatever parameters it, 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 it uses, right? Um, it's concise, yeah, it's quite uh, uh, small to, uh, to write things. All right, so how Haskell feels like? Um, kind of on, on, in some aspects, it feels like a normal programming language. So it has a function called uh, put string line, and it has strings which are kind of in a form of um, qu quoted text. Uh, so this basically prints um, hello world. Um, so it's kind of very similar to let's say py old Python. Um, and you see that parameters to a function uh, without parentheses. We do have parentheses, but no, most of the time you don't need them. Uh, you use them to just tell the parser that those things are kind of a single unit. Uh, but if you're passing parameters to a function, you don't use parentheses and you don't use comma. So, you know, um, in, uh, in other languages, it would be like this. So that means I have a list of parameters uh, to my uh, to my function in Haskell, if you have a print function which takes multiple arguments, like two arguments, it would be like this. So it'd be just a function name plus the parameters following it with spaces. Um, so hello world, sorted, easy. Um, okay, let's move on. Uh, we will do a little bit about functions. So. Functions have type, same as with other programming languages. Uh, so if I want to declare a function f uh, in C, I would say it returns an int. It has a name f, and then it has two parameters which are int, right? Uh, and then I have some variables here. Uh, so then I am kind of saying what it returns and what it takes as parameters. Uh, sorry, I would have to use a different symbol. And then what are the types of those things here, right? Um, of course, that doesn't work, uh, but in Golang, it would be, I have a function f, which takes, um, and which takes a and b, which are int, and then it returns an int, right? Uh, so you see the, the syntax is different, like the actual syntax is slightly different, uh, but the abstract syntax is kind of the same in both languages, right? Um, so how does that feel in Haskell? Well, in Haskell, um, let me clear that so we don't have the... Um, so if I want to declare a function f, and if I want to say it has a certain type, I use colon colon, and then I say what it takes as parameters. So I would say it takes an int and an int, and then the last element is what it returns. And then I would say it returns an int. Um, 
So this is how I declare a type of something. So those colon colon means type of something, right? Um, in, um, in C or Golang, we use the type kind of positioning. So the type comes after a declaration of a variable. Here, it also comes after, but you have to use this kind of um, uh, colon colon. So now I have a function f declared as a type. So th that means um, I have function f with this definition, which takes two parameters and returns something. Um, <clears throat> when you're playing with GCI, there are certain things which are um, uh, kind of not working. Like for example, uh, type definitions, you, you don't really do that here because if I, declare, um, if I declare a function f, it will infer what type it is and it kind of doesn't follow uh, pr properly sometimes. And printing like input output also with GHCI is a little bit clunky. So for, for, for some things, it's actually easier to use a project and a normal source code um, file. So if we, I, I will show you later. So function type is uh, declared with this colon colon uh, thing. And then function definition. So again, uh, in languages like uh, Golang or C, you write a kind of a declaration of the signature, uh, and then you kind of write the body of what, what it means. In C, you often had the kind of a declaration of the signature separate, and then you had the, like in the .h file, and then you had the definition in the .c file. Uh, here it's similar, like you declare the type first, and then you declare what it is. So for example, for function f, which takes two elements, I can say return the sum, okay? So now I'm declaring that there is a function f, which takes two elements, uh, a and b, and then I'm returning the sum of those two elements. So if I say one and two or three, I'm gonna get four as an outcome of the of that function. So this is the function uh, definition. This is the function declaration, right? Uh, you can ask, what is the type of F? Tell me about F. And you will see uh, it says F is a function which takes two parameters of type A and returns a third thing, which is of the same type as the parameters and those parameters have to be numbers. So we have here an, a type class constraining what the parameters could be because the function body uses a plus operator and you can only do plus operations on numbers, right? So we're not specifying what that number is. For example, if I use a float, uh, it will work fine. If I use ints, it will work fine too. But if I use uh, a string, it will say, no, no, wait a minute. Uh, the last one is not a number. Like number, like string is not a number. So you cannot use it, right? Um, in this declaration, I constrained it only to ints. So if, if that was the definition of F, I wouldn't be able to pass floating points. But if this is the definition of F um, here, I can put floating numbers or complex numbers, anything that is a number, and it will work fine, as long as those two are of the same type, right? Uh, so those two needs to be the same type, and the same type is returned here. So you may ask, okay, but you know that seems to be a float, and that seems to be an integer. Well, Haskell has um, uh, polymorphic literals, so that one is both a float and integer depending on which context you use it. So unlike other programming languages which don't have polymorphic literals, like a literal, like, you know, this literal and C is always an integer and that literal is always a float. In Haskell, that's not true. Uh, that literal can be float if you use it in a float context. It's a polymorphic literal, right? Um, so you already kind of see some some features which make this language a little bit more powerful than C because it has this kind of, uh, uh, you know, concepts which are kind of built in into the language. 
All right, so the next one, function arguments, we have already covered that, right? So notice that the difference between, if I say A, 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 when I'm declaring a type, what is this? Is it, is it a function argument variable? No, it's a type variable. It's a variable which defines a type. Languages like C or Golang, they don't have this concept of a variable for a type. You always have to put the type in. But C++ has that, right? In C++, if I'm using templates, and I said there is a template with a, a type variable T, capital T often, and then I say my function F, uh, if my function F takes two Ts and returns a T, that is a type variable, right? Because we don't know what concrete type it will be instantiated with. It could be for floats, it could be for ints, whatever. So the T is a type variable. So in Haskell is the same. So in Haskell, if I'm doing this, um, F is of type A, 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 it's like what I did with C++ when I said F returns T and takes two Ts as parameters. So it's like a templated definition, right? You follow me? Did you have templates in C++? Good, so you should know that. <laughs> All right, so then compare this to my declaration to F, A, and B uh, returns A plus B. Now, A and B are variables the same way as in C++, I would say some type A and some type B, right? So now A and B are kind of like the actual variables for the parameters for the function. So no real magic, slightly different syntax, but it kind of is the same concepts as you know from templates, right? It's just that you almost never use that in C++ because you kind of try to avoid templates. Uh, whereas in Haskell, you are forced to do that because everything is kind of templates by definition. Uh, so you are doing that all the time, just naturally. You naturally will say F is of type some template A, type A with some type A returns another A, right? If you only have one parameter, you will just have one A. So if let's say our function is just returns uh, 10, 10 plus A, that would be F is of type A returning A. you will quickly get used to that. Like it feels awkward and it feels kind of a weird, but this particular thing, it's not problematic. And then function application, what that is, it's invoking a function. So in languages like C++, you invoke the function by doing this, right? For, for the single parameter function, you would say this, I'm invoking a function by, by brackets, right? What if you have a function G, which doesn't take any parameters and you want to invoke it? Well, you, you, you do this, right? You invoking the function. Uh, in Haskell, what do you do to invoke a function? Well, you put space. So invoke G, you just say G space. That's how you invoke G. And to invoke F, you say F 10, because it, it kind of needs a parameter or two or three. So, uh, function invocation or function application is just space in Haskell, uh, which they often say it's quite cute because it's the most concise way of invoking a function. You just have space. Uh, no brackets, no fancy sugar, nothing else. All right, so basic types, we have true, false, uh, numbers, uh, strings, tuples, structs, same as any other programming language. Um, you can kind of go to the interactive um, uh, interactive thing and say, tell me about true. And it says, oh yeah, true is an instance of bool. You see, uh, it is defined in GHC types and there is something else and true. So can you tell me about bool then? Yeah, it can. A bool is a kind of an enum type, which has, either false or true, right? 
So a bull is either false or true. And that's what bulls are. No, no magic here. So tell me about one. Oh, it doesn't know how to deal with that. So let's try that. It doesn't know how to deal with that neither. So it, it's, it cannot tell me about uh, one. But if I say it's an int, can you tell me about that? Not really. No. So let's ask it for numbers. So let, let's ask it about int first. So int is defined somewhere and it has a number of type classes which are kind of um, defined for it. So it's, a, it's an enum, it's integral, it's a number, uh, it's real, it, you can show it, you can equate and so on. So you kind of see a little bit of what you can do with it. So can you tell me about num? Yes, it can tell me about num. So number is anything that has those operations defined for it, right? Um, so it has plus minus multiplication, uh, negation, absolute value, uh, the, um, yeah, the negative or positive. And then I can com convert to a number from uh, integers, from integer uh, types. Um, and then the minimal definitions are those. Either negate or minus. So negate and minus will kind of be um, aliases. Yeah, we will talk about type classes a little bit more later. Uh, tuple, uh, you have it in uh, some languages. You don't really have it in C, I don't think. Maybe in the modern C, they introduce a, a tuple type. Uh, I, I don't know, uh, but you do have tuples in C++. Um, so you define a tuple as a, it's kind of like a very constrained struct, which has a, a predefined number of uh, fields. And the fields don't have names. The fields just have order. Um, and you usually, um, you, you do have tuples in, um, uh, in Rust. In Golang, it almost has tuples, but the, the, the tuples are kind of a, the generated a little bit in Golang. So for example, in Golang, you can say, uh, you can say this, my, I have a function uh, f, which takes no arguments or takes one argument, let's say it takes one int, and it returns two things. It returns an int and an error, right? So this int and an error is kind of like a tuple because it returns two things always. And uh, if I have definition like that, I can then call f, uh, let's say I'm calling f with, with one, and I can say assign x and error to what f returns now. So it returns two things, right? So it kind of feels like a tuple, but it, it, it is kind of not quite like a tuple because you cannot do certain things with it. Um, if it was a proper tuple, uh, you could, um, you could kind of pass it around. Like I could uh, say return A from F and A is a tuple now. I cannot do that in Golang. I, I can do that, that version, right? Uh, but I cannot do that version and A is as a tuple. In, in the languages which have tuple, like in Rust, I could do that. Like I could get the tuple out and then say, you know, uh, first and second uh, element of, of my tuple A, right? So in Haskell, you do have tuples and tuples are um, uh, same as in Rust. It's just like, a, uh, for example, one and Marius. That's a tuple of uh, a number. We don't know what one is. It could be float, could be an in integer and a string. Uh, let's close the... So that's a tuple of two with two fields. And then if I say, okay, my A is a tuple, then uh, you, you have functions like give me the first element of the tuple or give me the second, second element of the tuple, right? So you can access um, the, the elements, uh, elements of the tuple using functions. So tuple is useful. And of course, Haskell has lists. 
So lists is a very fundamental data structure in, um, in Haskell, uh, and you will use it for a lot of things. Um, same as you're using arrays and slices in Golang or arrays or lists in, um, uh, for iterators in C++. Here, lists you, you will use everywhere. So, okay, how the list looks like, you're, I already showed you before. It, it is a square bracket construction uh, and it has kind of a list of elements. So let's say we starting with numbers. So this is a list of three numbers. Um, so I have a list L. Uh, let's use four numbers. It'll be easier to see some things. So L is a list of four numbers. Uh, and then I can print L. Um, and I have some useful functions like head and tail. Uh, head of L gives me the first element of the list and tail uh, gives me the rest be besides the first element, right? Um, what else do we have? So let's do that such that we see where we are. Okay, next one is init last length and concatenation. And another type of concatenation. Yeah, those two somewhat are a little bit confusing, but they are not too hard. So let's go again one by one. So init L, init L gives me all the elements, but the last one. So it gives all the elements with, without the last one. And then the last, of course, gives you the last element. So head and tail and init and last are kind of symmetrical, right? Uh, head gives you the first one and tail gives you the rest. Init gives you the rest, but the last one and last gives you the last one. So those are the four functions. Length, it's the same as in uh, um, other programming languages, gives you the length of the list. Um, so we have four elements, length gives you that. Notice that in functional programming, we compose uh, functions by uh, putting the function name first and then the arguments, um, which is true for most of the functions in C or C++ or, 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 or Golang 2. But for this particular thing, often you would say this, right? You would say length or length, depending on the concrete syntax, right? Um, and that returns you the length for the list L, right? So the argument comes first and then the method is on the, on the argument. And that kind of feels like the method name of all of a particular object, right? In, uh, in Haskell, we don't do that. We don't have brackets and we don't have kind of things like that. We always have functions which are functions. We, we don't have a concept of a method. So functions are always functions. They are kind of, um, they live in a particular names, namespace and they are followed by arguments. So we, we do kind of this. Okay, now those two. So um, let's say I have uh, my L, which is those four elements and I want to concatenate a zero in front. So then I can do it in two different ways. Um, I can say there is a zero which follows L and that's my uh, new list, right? And my new list now is with zero in front. Or I can say my new list is zero list, is a list of with element zero concatenated with my L. And that will create basically the same thing. So plus plus, is for concatenating one list with another list, right? And the colon, uh, colon is for appending in front a single element. So you can append a single element in front of the list. And for that, you're using a colon. Um, all right. And then we have a null check. So for example, if I have a null list, which is empty, empty list, and I check, is my null list empty? It will say true. And is my L empty? It will say false. So it's just checking if the list is empty or not. 
Okay, so now we have a little bit more fun, which is uh, list comprehensions. Uh, how would you do, uh, let's say you want to create a list uh, with um, four elements in Golang. So let's go to Go Tour. Yep. And let's say I want to have, uh, I don't want to print hello world. I want to print a list L and my list L is, is a list of uh, four elements. One, two, three, four. How would I do that? A slice. Do you know? Who knows? Yeah, can you dictate? Yeah, that's, that's, you feel like me all the time. <laughs> it's like, what was the syntax? I know. All right, so the syntax is we have, like Golang actually has a, a little bit of a logic to it, right? So we have to start with a type. So it has to be a slice. So the slice is, is uh, this. And then for the slice, you need to say what type is that slice. So we want ints. Right, so we say int, uh, and then we have to declare uh, what the elements are, and kind of similarly to C++, you do it in curly braces. So we do that like this, right? Maybe, I don't know, I'm not sure that, but that's what I kind of remember, let's, let's test. <laughs> I remember correctly. All right, so it worked. So I declared, um, I declared a type, uh, and I initialized it. Right, so that works. Okay, a, a, a side comment. What will happen if I if I try to do that thing? Let's compile it. Okay, so it says the value of that type is not used. Right, so it. Is that a statement or is that an expression? It will be in the exam. So you guys need to know that. So I have a, a list L, which is, okay. Line number six, is it a expression or is it a statement? Okay, I will add the curly braces there and let's let's try to compile it. Syntax error, unexpected opening bracket. At the end of statement, woohoo, we have our answer. This is a statement, <laughs> right? This line number six is a statement. Line number seven is an expression. Why? Because I cannot assign this to A, but I can assign this to A. This will not work. You cannot assign statements to anything, but you can assign a value out of the expression, right? All right, so here we have um, a declaration of, so this is, yeah, L. This is a statement. This is, this is an expression, uh, which is evaluated to a value, which is assigned to L. We don't need that. Like if, if, if we do that, what will happen? Well, this guy says you should have on the left-hand side a new variable, but you don't have a new variable. You have an existing variable, which we know the type of, so it's illegal. So I have to delete that. All right, so anyway, that works. That works fine. How would you define this for a thousand numbers? So you want L to be from one to thousand. How would you do that?
Unfortunately, they don't have a literal syntax or expression syntax to express it in Golang. So you'd have to have a, a, a loop and you have to use append function. It would have to be appending X thousand times to L to create that list, right? So I would have to have a for loop um, to iterate over X and append X, right? So that sucks. So coming back to here, list comprehension. Com concise notation to declare a new list. Yay, what we can do is we can say L is a new list which goes from one to thousand. And uh, that's the new list, right? So a list comprehension um, also allows me to do something more than just declaring arbitrary lists like this. Um, I can, for example, create a list which uh, goes from um, one to thousand. Uh, let's do two hundred, and I only want odd uh, axes, right? So those of you who know Python. That notation, the kind of a concept of list comprehension will be not new. So it's kind of the same in Haskell. So we have kind of a, we enclose everything into a list. We say, we are gonna have a list and that list is gonna be something. And those something are X's and X's are generated. We have a genera generator here, which generates us all the X's. So it goes from one to hundred. We could go to infinity if we wanted to. Um, and then after comma, we either have additional generators or we have constraints. And here we have a constraint saying um, X needs to be odd, right? So then we, we have a list of all odd numbers between one and hundred. Uh, and if you ask what is odd, odd takes a, you know, a number and it returns bool depending whether the number is even or odd, right? So the other one is even, it's the same and it returns uh, even numbers and odd returns odd numbers. So a list comprehension is a structure which has some sort of variables here or single variable or a tuple. We could generate the tuples, right? So let's generate tuples X and Y uh, and let's draw uh, X's from, uh, let's draw X's from one to five. And let's draw Y's from uh, six to nine. So now we, we generated kind of X comes from this generator and Y comes from this generator. So first we had uh, one, 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 one for all the possible Y's. And then we had two, blah, 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 three, four, five. So it is kind of like two nested loops, which generate us the X's and Y's, and then you create the tuples for the, for the pairs, uh, pairs for, for those numbers. So it kind of is a concise notation, which replaces for us two nested loops for X and for Y. Okay, useful to combine with ranges. I just showed you with ranges often replace for the, the need for a loop. So instead of doing a loop, I have this, right? So now knowing this and knowing that you can generate a list of, um, you know, you, you, you can have certain constraints, right? So you can say, um, I want, uh, I don't know, uh, numbers, odd numbers from uh, one to something. Normally you would think about it in terms of loops, but here you can achieve that without the loop, right? So you're kind of achieving something that is iterative, but you don't think in terms of iterations, you think in terms of what you want, what you want to achieve, right? Um, okay, so some more useful functions about um, uh, lists. So all of those are for numerical lists. So for example, if I have my L, uh, L is too big. So let's do L being from one to 10. 
So now I can say, um, give me a sum of L. And what it does, it basically sums all the numbers inside my list and gives me the sum. Uh, product works the same way. Uh, take takes a parameter. So tell me about take. Uh, take takes an integer and a list and returns a list, right? It doesn't kind of tell you exactly what take will do, but if you try it, if you say take two out of L, it, you know, L is the four numbers or 10 numbers and take basically takes the first N numbers out of the list. Um, so take one is equivalent. It's exactly the same as head, right? Uh, with that um, distinction that it will give me a list as an output, right? So compare take L, take one L gives me a list with one and head gives me one. It, it returns an element, not the list and so on. Drop is the same as take, but it drops the, um, the, the particular number of elements. Maximum and minimum searches for the maximum or minimum element of the list. So you can play with that. Um, okay, so knowing all of that, uh, write the list comprehension that produces squares of odd numbers from one to, to 11. That should be easy. Perfect, but it produces the squares of those odd numbers. So there is one small thing missing. Yep, exactly. So that's the list comprehension. So uh, it's literally one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, uh, 20 characters. How long that would take you in C? Longer. In Golang, also longer. Um, all right, so list comprehensions are cool and they are useful. And you can, yeah, you can, you can use this, I think, as well. Let's try it if that works. If, yeah, that works. So it should work with variables. So if x is four, x to the power of two will be 16. Perfect, that works too. So if you're not sure about some syntax, GHCI is kind of a way for you to test it. Um, all right, perfect. Um, okay, so here write a function called myLen that takes a list as an argument and returns the length of that list. <clears throat> also very trivial. You normally would not write function like that because uh, you don't need to. There is a length a function which gives you that exactly. But if you were to write my len, uh, how, how would you do that? Um, so here I will write that uh, my len definition of the type. So it takes a list of some type A and returns an int, which is the length of that of that. Um, of that list. That would be the type declaration. What would be the definition of the function? Let's check what length returns. Uh, yeah, length returns an int. Okay. So my, my definition is correct. So my len takes an arbitrary list of any type that we want and returns an int. We don't even uh, need to say what A is. It can be anything. Like we don't care what A is. Yeah, that would be in Golang. Uh, you would, yeah, it, it's almost good in Golang. Uh, what's, what's wrong with, with the, 
with this. Golang doesn't have a list, so it has a slice. You would have to say what slice it is, right? So you'd have to say square brackets int, for example, that it's a slice of int. Yeah. Yep, that's a good one. So, so the third one is a good good uh, definition. So there is a uh, with the uh, mistake that not not f but mylan, right? So we we would do this. Uh, we would say mylan of something equals length of that something, right? In Haskell, um, if you have the last argument to your function being the last argument in your definition, you can actually um, mylan two. Um, you you can actually delete this a from that definition. It's point point three. So if you do that, this is point point three notation, which means the actual argument here, which is the last argument to the function, is implied, and therefore we don't have to use this a. In, on the left and right hand sides at all. We just say my length is length. It's, it's kind of the same as length, right? So if, if we try them now, um, my length from L is 10 and my length two from L is 10, right? It works the same way. Perfect. Okay, but now you have to do that without using the length, okay? Uh, you can do it at home as a homework. <laughs> so what is uh, useful in, in lists also? Um, we have a um, um, package which has those additional functions. Uh, and if you want to play with that package, you have to say there is a module M. So you say module and you say uh, data list. And you kind of say, I want to include. No, you actually say like this. So let's not do that yet. And let's say, uh, can you tell me about intersperse? And says, no, no, I don't know what intersperse is. I, it's not in my scope. So if you say include data list, and now tell me about intersperse, it says, oh yeah, intersperse is a function which takes something of type A and the list of type A, and then it returns the list of type A. So it, it again, um, doesn't tell you exactly uh, what it is, but you can, you, you can um, play with it. So remember we have list of those things and we can um, intersperse zero with our L and it basically puts zero between each element of the uh, of the list. How useful is that? Well, for lists, for like a list like this, it might not be that useful unless you want to create tuples of, of some sort of, sometimes it's useful, but it's super useful if you, for example, have, um, if you have um, uh, words in a list and you want to intersperse them with space. So for example, if I have um, uh, a list, I have a list of hello world. Um, and I want to intersperse it with space, right? So now I will have a list of hello space word I can then concatenate it and print it as a um, uh, as a single string, and then I will have a kind of a space between my words. So intercalate kind of does that. Uh, what I just said. So intersperse injects the space between the words in a list and intercalate basically does that and then combines all the elements of that list into a single list and then I get up get kind of a single string right um, transpose transposes the uh, the list 
So uh, we kind of covered the very basic things of um, um, of Haskell. Uh, I showed you a little bit how to play with uh, GHCI. Um, I have created. Uh, if you go to if you go to the labs. So if, if we go to labs, there is a first lab. And it says do kind of four things. So it says do a fizz bus, write hello world, which asks for a name, uh, read numbers, and print this kind of multiplication table up to n, uh, kind of a nicely formatted. So what I would like you to do is I would like you to do this as a homework and do a pull request into the lab repo with solutions to those four things. Um, those of you who will struggle, you can kind of uh, make a pull request with questions that you struggled. Those of you who can solve it, just make a pull request that you solved it. And then in the lab, we will kind of go over it. We'll discuss it a little bit and we'll discuss different ways of achieving that, right? Um, and then if we run out of time, uh, if we have more time, we will do a little bit more, more things on Thursday. So for Thursday, do this as a homework. Uh, make a pull request before Thursday, and then on Thursday, we're going to discuss it. Um, I was thinking of, um, it's up, up to you how, how you want to do it, but we would like to have some incentive mechanisms or some punishment mechanisms for people who will not do that, right? So there will be students who will not do any pull requests. They will show up and they will just kind of passively observe what's going on, right? Uh, we would like to discourage that. So we can either punish those students <laughs> somehow, or we can reward the students who will do pull requests. Pizza, Pizza yeah, that's an option. <laughs> uh, but then you will have to kind of uh, police the ones who didn't do pull requests not to eat the pizza. Um, so think about it. And on Thursday, we can decide, OK, uh, what to do. I was thinking giving some uh, bonus points for all the students who do pull requests, which will kind of accumulate to a certain amount, let's say 10% or I don't know how many labs we will have, uh, which will be added to your kind of a portfolio grade, right? Uh, that's one option. Uh, but there will be some incentive mechanism or some punishment mechanism. So I encourage everybody to do a pull request. All right, thank you. If you have any questions, you can post them as an issue in the uh, GitLab. So, sorry yeah do do that in Pascal. yes so that that says here in Pascal. yeah thank you very much